We are well past this year's halfway mark, which means we're getting down to it as far as getting to 10,000 subscribers by the end of 2011. That, may I remind you, is the goal of the Marketplace of Ideas this year. 10,000 podcast subscribers by the end of the year. If we get them, we'll keep on going on, keep on giving you cultural conversation of the depth you demand into the future and, sure, well beyond. If we don't get it, though... That spells the end. So if we're going to get 10,000 by the end of this year, we'll need 401 new subscribers just this week. Just this week alone. So make sure if you have friends who don't know about the show, who you think would benefit from knowing about it, who would lead more enriched lives if they did, let them know. Send them an email. Give them a call. Send them a Facebook message. Post something on Facebook. Post something on Twitter. Recommend favorite interviews. Or, best of all, review the show on iTunes. That seems always to raise the program's profile. You can search for the Marketplace of Ideas in the iTunes store. Give the show a star rating and a review and express your opinions about the positives and the negatives, if you like, of the program on iTunes. Thanks. Now, we're recording this in KCSB Studios in Santa Barbara, you know, in the town where you, in part, grew up and one you come back to often. What does it feel like to be in Santa Barbara right now, this time, this visit? It always feels like uh, a sanctuary and it always feels like a bit of a ret- retreat from life, the kind of place where you step out of your life, the better to know how to go back into it. And I'm today in particular is a curious moment for me because uh, for more than 40 years, I've been plundering the resources of this university in which we're sitting, <laughs> uh, taking out every last library book on my mother's library card or taking over the last great seat at some UCSB event. And yesterday I actually gave a commencement address here. So it's the first time I've given something back to the community after almost half a century. From KCSB in Santa Barbara and Colin Marshall Radio, I'm Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas, and I'm speaking with Pico Iyer, who is the one who is the one I read when I want to know how being in a place feels. He's written books like The Lady and the Monk, like Video Night in Kathmandu, Tropical Classical, Sun After Dark, Abandoned, Cuba in the Night, The Global Soul, The Open Road. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a few, but those are those are many of the books that have been called travel books. But I, I think there's something. There's something more here. And, you know, I'll ask you this. I know this is, I, this must not be a book that's been written, but not by you, but by anybody in general. Do, do you think the great book about Santa Barbara has yet to be written? Maybe so. Of course, there are novelists and terrific poets who have uh, turned their eye to this. And I think quickly of T.C. Boyle and Sue Grafton and uh, Gretel Ehrlich in a different way. And I think for 50, 60 years, any poet who comes to Santa Barbara for three days or um, three minutes, it seems, is moved <laughs> to, to apostrophize it or rhapsodize it in some form. I suppose there is a Santa Barbara book to be written. It's not one that I could write because I've mm. always been a visitor here. And one of the curious things, as we both know, is that so many of us are tourists in Santa Barbara, even for decades at a time. And how to penetrate the real Santa Barbara or how to know even what the real Santa Barbara is among the many Santa Barbaras that coexist would be quite a challenge, I think. So uh, it's almost as if you can only take a small piece of it, as much as with L.A. or London, perhaps. And reading your books, you know, I get these occasional snippets of your views on Santa Barbara. You bring it up as, you know, the place where you in part grew up, as I said, or you meet many people from Santa Barbara in your travels, an unusual amount. But then again, people from Santa Barbara kind of it comes to the surface sometimes when you're traveling around. And I wonder what it, what it says about the place. I'm trying to assemble all of the, all of the pieces about Santa Barbara that have, are scattered across your books. You know, it, it, it brings to mind what I've heard from, from other longtime residents who, who will say things like oh, Santa Barbara used to be weirder, used to be more fun, used to, used to be its own, its own place. And I remember a line from, I believe the lady in the monk where you say, you know, Santa Barbara has, has been stripped of its idiosyncrasies and has become a, a bright young thing for bright young things. What does that mean? <laughs> and I was saying that, that book uh, I wrote in 1988, so it shows that nostalgia ain't what it used to be, <laughs> that people are perennially uh, de- decrying the the loss of their homes. And I think that's the nature of a hometown. It's a place that is never what it used to be. And whichever town you and I were speaking in now, people would be saying the same thing. And I remember I actually once 
read uh, that that sentence that you just delivered here in Santa Barbara at Chaucer's Bookstore, and the, <laughs> quite a few of the seven people in attendance rose up for, to, to, to cry it. <laughs> These days, I find that um, Santa Barbara does seem as if it's being sucked ever more into the great open moor of Los Angeles and has mm. become Santa Monica North. And I'm sure everybody you've talked to has noted in the last 15 years that uh, the freeway has got larger and there are more cars on it. And, and they uh, took the stoplight off the freeway. Exactly. And the place got more crowded after that. It took away the, the quaint little uh, forgotten town quality of it. But you're right. I think one way or another, I have returned to Santa Barbara over and over again in my imagination and in my writing as well as uh, in my life. And I remember in the novel that you mentioned, Im- amazingly, you reeled off, I think, just about all of my books uh, <laughs> impromptu when you were listing them a minute ago. But that novel called Abandon was almost setting Santa Barbara against um, the great Islamic centers of the world mm. like Damascus and Iran and uh, and Delhi and uh, Granada. Uh, and I suppose there I was using it, as many people might, as the last word in young America. So the the the, f- the furthest west you can get and the ultimate in terms of what we associate not just with the new world, America, but the new world's new world, California. It's California to the sixth degree, perhaps, insofar as it's a place full of notions, possibilities, and dreams. But I always wonder how deeply it's anchored in reality. Uh, And um, so it was interesting to play this newest of new worlds off against the oldest of old worlds. And as somebody who's essentially coming here from the old world, whether it's the England where I grew up or the Japan where I now live or the other places that I visit, I can see the fascination of it and the constraint. Uh, and I, uh, to me, I suppose it's a little like meeting um, a bewitching and very beautiful teenager <laughs> whose beauty, freshness, and hopefulness one envies, especially as the years go on, uh, but whose fitness for the world one worries about a bit. Now, you do you do drop these these reactions to Santa Barbara or remembrances of Santa Barbara throughout your books, throughout your work. And you also encounter Santa Barbara in the places you go, but not so much in the Santa Barbarans, but in the, I think of an image from one book. You're in Asia and you see t-shirts that say like Santa Barbara, high fashion dream, something like that. You know, and I look around, high fashion dream. <laughs> you no, know, it's, it's kind of a contrast it feels like to me as a resident of the, of the place, but it's, it's something that I, I mean, I wonder how much you can get And let's go beyond Santa Barbara even, but how much you can draw or how much do you want to draw about this place or another place through sort of the perceptions of other people of other countries who might not have even have been here? You know, the the ways it's reflected off of other cultures. Does that, I mean, that's tangled, kind of a hopeless question, but does it make sense? It's a wonderful question and you've instantly cut to the heart of all my work. Certainly, (laughs) Well, we're done, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yes, because when you said so nicely in your... uh, opening question that my books are often called travel books, but they're not really that. And I thought you were going to ask me, what are they? And I would have said they're about the exchange of dreams or illusions. And that's exactly what you what you just mentioned, which is to say the place Santa Barbara holds in the imagination of people around the world who've never been here and the place that Tibet, say, or Islam holds in the minds of people in Santa Barbara who've never been to, to those cultures. Uh, and you're so absolutely right. When you, when you mentioned that line about a bright young thing for bright young things, <laughs> I think I was alluding to the soap opera Santa Barbara, which, of course, yes. has given our little town much greater weight, authority, and allure around the world. Especially in France, oddly enough. Exactly. And, and where I notice it, in uh, my ancestral home of India, mm. where it was screened, it's probably being screened as we speak here, but screened long after. <laughs> It had outlived its usefulness. And so it became a shorthand, as Malibu or Beverly Hills or certain other places have been, for everything that people want to project onto America, the land of absolute freedom to the point of unbounded license, of glamour, of affluence, of possibility, of all the things, of course, they don't have at home. And, you know, I think one of the great things about traveling is the way that it it moves you to look at your home with new eyes, just as your question was suggesting, and often more appreciative eyes. Because as I think you were saying, as you and I sit here in Santa Barbara, as somewhat long-time residents, both of us are aware of the imperfections or the ways it doesn't conform to people's rosy dreams of it. But it's wonderful to go out into the world and see those rosy dreams. And in Japan, where I live, uh, and with my wife, whom you just met, Santa Barbara is a byword for possibility (laughs) and for everything they don't have there. Uh, And it's good to be reminded. You know, I think I travel as much as anything uh, to fall in love with my home again. 
It is a good point because, as I mentioned off mic before, almost a decade here has, for me, stripped me of pretty much all the appreciation for Santa Barbara. A lot of it, not all of it, but with not much travel in mm. those 10 years, you know, you get to think, well, any, any place is a gilded cage at a certain point. And I want to know... I want to know how this applies, this idea of the reflected dreams of a place, how that applies to, well, I'll put it this way. We talked off mic again about uh, a professor here at UCSB named John Nathan, a scholar of Japan who's been on this show, a a favorite interview of mine here. Um, Don't know what he thought of it, but hey, it was fun. Uh, He he got to talking about about the students he teaches now about Japan and who for whom Japan is kind of. Uh, a, a sanctuary. They they see it as a sanctuary, an escape, a refuge. Like, I grew I grew up in California, and no one understands me, but they will in Japan. It's it, kind of an odd thing to to say, but it's a sentiment I've noticed a lot in my generation. Now, you live in Japan. How does that dream, to the extent you've encountered it, seem to you? You know, that dream of Japan as an escape for the Westerner, and really, a lot of people my age seem to think Japan is some sort of paragon of perfection. You know what I mean? Mm. And a part of me believes that even after 24 years of living Mm. there. You know, when I was growing up in Santa Barbara, I always felt that Japan was my secret home, the unacknowledged place that belonged more deeply and intimately to me than the houses in which I lived and the addresses that I could give. And the remarkable thing was that that impression withstood even my first meeting with Japan and that I still, although of course it didn't begin to conform to the rosy romantic picture I'd constructed in my head, it still made sense to me in a way that no other culture did. So I think there were, I mean, I'm, I, of course I'm lucky to be able to bring both Japan and Santa Barbara, spring and autumn, new world and old, into the same frame. And I think I would never want to be a Jap- Japanese. And I think those of us who live in Japan as foreigners live in an almost unreal paradise because, of mm-hmm. course, we enjoy all the benefits of that society with none of the pressures or responsibilities. We're, we're permanent tourists in a sense, or I am at least, and I never pay taxes to Japan. I just enjoy <laughs> um, its graces, its gift for silence, uh, its its sense of attention and all the other things that people love about it. Uh, but I'm, I, your question is a fine one because I am interested in um, in the dreams that we have about all other places, but especially Japan. And what impressed me when I first arrived there, as you mentioned before, was first to meet so many Santa Barbarans, and second to see that how many of them had found what they wanted, if only a small corner of Japan that they'd half constructed in their heads. But Japan is unusually good at giving visitors what, uh, what they want. <laughs> uh, partly because it's very hospitable and obliging and eager to make harmony, partly because it's so good at playing itself and at playing certain roles. At uh, And, you know, famously in Japan, you go into a coffee shop and there's one where they're all dressed as maids and the next they're all dressed as nurses and the next they're all dressed as schoolgirls. And Japan <laughs> is in some ways saying, you know, tell us what your fantasy is and we will provide it at a price. And that works for those of us with dreams of Japan. Just before we lose ourselves in Japan, I wanted to go back to what you were saying about Santa Barbara uh, and to say that I'm sure when, when you leave Santa Barbara, uh, you, will, you will miss it. Uh, yes. And once I'm already I'm pre missing Santa Barbara. <laughs> already, yes. I'm trying to get sick of you know my favorite places, Sojourner and such. You know, just <laughs> hope, hoping that I'm so tired of Santa Barbara. Yes, it's inevitable. You're right, um, absolutely right. I love the Sojourner too. And there's a famous line about Kyoto by Basho saying, uh, "Even in Kyoto, I long for Kyoto." So you're already <laughs> in that state for Santa Barbara. I long for the dream of Santa Barbara. You're a true Japanese. No, I wouldn't be surprised by me doing Kyoto soon. <laughs> um, but and the other thing that I think everybody notices is, for example, two years ago I took my mother. As she was nearing 80 on a cruise through the Mediterranean. We went to many of the most beautiful places on earth, from the Greek islands of Santorini and Patmos to Capri to Ephesus uh, to Jerusalem. And the only drawback in that whole trip was that every one of these beautiful places looked exactly like Santa Barbara. And at some oh point we God. realized, looking out on the blue Mediterranean with whitewashed houses and people enjoying La Dolce Vita, it couldn't have been nicer and therefore it only made us remember how easy we have it here and how we're living in the place, as you were saying, that everybody else wants to get to. Now, I don't, I don't imagine that bothered you so much because, you know, reading, reading about your travels, it seems like fairly early on you got the message that a place looks, sounds, smells a certain way, but that isn't the important thing. Increasingly, it's not the important thing to write about because we could Google Street View around if we really want to see what a place looks like. I mean, I do that all the time. That it's beside the point to you, I would imagine, that a place looks like Santa Barbara. It could be identical to Santa Barbara, but by virtue of it springing from another culture, I mean, what's the indefinable thing that 
that does matter to you, that would matter if it was like Santa Barbara. Do you know what I mean? Again. Wonderfully said. No, that's, that's perfect. And in fact, in the trip I was just describing, we were only spending one day in each of those places. Mm. So all we could see were the postcard surfaces. And you're absolutely right. It's only those surfaces that, that do correspond to Santa Barbara. So if, if you and I were to be airlifted this moment, so let's say the south of France, which geographically looks so similar, all we would notice are the differences and the way that the people are more aggressive, probably more chic to <laughs> Uh, that they're that they're trapped within age-old social hierarchies that we don't have here. So, mm. um, so yes, I, I've got to say that although I write a lot about foreign cultures, I do tend to write about them as a tourist and uh, in terms of their surfaces often because I don't want to pretend to get deeper into them than I really am. In most cases, I don't speak the language. I haven't studied their, their culture or their history. And so what I'm offering really is a newcomer's response and vision, which is often not much deeper than the surface. And um, so I would quickly pick up on physical similarities to Santa Barbara. But you're right. Um, For example, when I go back and forth between Santa Barbara and Japan, what I notice is um, the silences, which are much more intense in Japan, uh, all the things people aren't saying in Japan, which they're constantly saying here, and just that the the whole social structure works in an almost opposite way. This line that you said a bit ago about not wanting to be Japanese, I I come back to it in my mind based on your last answer there, because I think I thought the same thing myself, even though I haven't been to Japan. It it seems like Japan is the best of times and worst of times, depending on how you look at it. You know, as a foreigner, it can be a wonderland. Mm. As as a Japanese, I suspect it's not exactly that. Uh, There's hidden we hear about the million hidden hierarchies and the sort of web you're caught within in a lot of cultures not just japanese but um and especially as an american that's that's striking to think of that as being the case but you know you think of it as i think of it as a place where the edges are beautifully sanded but they're sanded off if Mm. you know what i mean so that fascinates me and i have to imagine that you've thought that about more than japan i'm glad i'm not I'm glad I didn't come up here. I'm glad I'm not rooted in this culture. Is that how you think of it? Probably so. I mean, I'm glad to be a foreigner everywhere. And there is no culture I would claim as my own. But of the cultures where I am to be living outside the the center, Japan is the one that agrees with me most, maybe Mm. because the lines are so clear cut and that I will always be a foreigner and there'll be no ambiguity about my part within uh, the national pageant. And I think what what we're always looking for or when when we're seeking out a place or a person or a life is that mix of strangeness and familiarity. So what appeals to me about Japan is that it's exotic. It's still more like another planet than any other culture that I've been to. Uh, unfathomable, and I don't expect ever to close that distance. And yet parts of it are mysteriously familiar, as if I knew it in a previous life. And other parts, are like the hierarchies and the web of social obligations you were describing, are very similar to the England that I grew up mm-hmm. in. So it's sort of returning to my boyhood, but with inscrutable characters. You know, my boyhood suddenly <laughs> rendered foreign and romantic, therefore. It reminds me of this this line I read from Ian Baruma, who was on the show a couple of years ago, saying that the foreigner in Japan is treated like the, the drunk or the child, not expected to conform, but and and a humiliating role in some ways, but a, a wonderful role if you if you know how to how to make it suit you. Mm. Do you agree with that? Yes, and a very, very liberating role, as long as you can, as you, as you so well added at the end of your question, as long as you can accept that you've been cast in a role and that everybody's going to see you in that role, whether you like it or not. So people who have a fragile sense of identity, perhaps, who are affronted by Japan. And, you know, why do these people see me as a caricature? But I'm very happy to, be a, uh, to, to play a caricature in a very smoothly running orchestral symphonic piece, which is how Japanese society works. And when I first got there, much as Ian, who's an old friend of mine, said, um, I thought, well, every foreigner here becomes kind of Bon Jovi or uh, <laughs> um, a heavy metal rock star. So expected to act out, to ex- act uh, outrageously, sort of halfway between Bon Jovi and Ozzy Osbourne. Perhaps. Yes. Um, so uh, strangely glamorous to these people because we belong to this parallel world. Encouraged to be oafish, brutish. The, the more outlandishly we act, the better we're playing being the foreigner, hmm. uh, and exempt from all the rules. And indeed, our part is to break every taboo and to be the bull in the China shop or the Japanese shop. So there are, as you said, there are some people who don't feel comfortable with that. 
But uh, I think it's um, it's a nice kind of diplomatic immunity that we have to do. Anything we do there uh, is going to fit the notion of a foreigner. The only people who suffer in Japan are the ones who want to become Japanese, to disappear within it, or to neutralize the distance between them and the society. And many people, I'm sure, have said to you on this show that the better you speak Japanese, the harder it is you to adapt. The <laughs> Japanese feel threatened, yes. yes. I mean, it's a rare culture where they're not flattered by your interest in and they feel you're intruding upon their space. And the polar opposite of, say, Korea. Yes, which is a much more um, expansive, gregarious society, I think. Um, if you yeah. say two words in it, from my experience, mm. well, you're in. Yes. You're a family member then. Yes. Well, I think if you say two words in Japan, you're okay too. It's just if you speak to say 200,000 yes. words, then they, they feel... Then there's going to be trouble. <laughs> yes. yes. And, you know, Donald Ritchie, one of, the, one of my favorite writers about only, only Japan, um, he's not less a traveler than a, a Japan resident, uh, he has, seems to have accepted his, his distance from the society, his place in it, and he often brings up a saying I've, I've read in your books as well. And this, I've never been sure of the origins, but the one about how... You know, stage one is finding your homeland suite. Stage two is finding a foreign country suite. Stage three is when every country is now foreign. You, you know what mm. I'm referring mm. to, right? Do you know the origins of that? Well, I think Hugo of St. Victor, who was a 13th century monk, he formulates it beautifully because he was talking about monasticism. And the ideal for a monk of living on earth is to see the whole world as a foreign place, that in some ways you're in exile from some deeper home and that all your time on earth is just a preparation for a return home. So you're speaking about it in a in a specific spiritual context, but it certainly has application now. And one of the things that Donald Ritchie says so wonderfully always is that in going to Japan, he was happy to trade the sense of belonging for the sense of freedom. And because he didn't want to be a member of a group, and yet he did want to be his own person, he realized quickly that in Japan where he'd always be an outsider, but always be exempt from the local laws. He was um, in an ideal position. I'm so thrilled that you mentioned him just today. <laughs> two things happened to me today. The first was that I, I have a Japan-loving friend in Singapore who's the CEO of an advertising company, mm -hmm. and I was thinking of the ideal present I could give to him as a replica of Japan, and I bought him the Donald Ritchie Reader from Chaucer's oh, yesterday. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I thought, just as you said, and I couldn't agree with you more, that this is the best possible introduction to Japan. In fact, for me, Donald Ritchie is the greatest foreign writer that I'm aware of who's ever written on Japan, including the other one I was write, reading today by chance, Lafcadio Hearn, who mm -hmm. is always regarded as the great foreign voice. But I think Donald Ritchie, who has been in Japan since the occupation, 1947, and who's lived there more or less uninterruptedly for 64 years in a, in a quiet room in Tokyo, attentively just walking the streets and taking everything in from the sex clubs to the baseball games to the emperor to uh, the, the temples. He has Japan beautifully. Just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas, and I'm Colin Marshall. We're sitting down this week with Pico Iyer, writer, traveler, author of books like Video Night and Kathmandu, The Lady and the Monk, Falling Off the Map, Cuba and the Night, Tropical Classical, The Global Soul, Abandon, Sun After Dark, The Open Road, and more to come, I'm sure, one of which we'll talk about in this conversation. When it's over, if you want to hear it again, by the way, you can listen at ColinMarshallRadio.com or on iTunes, search for the Marketplace of Ideas in the iTunes Store. Either way, you can download all of the Marketplace of Ideas past interviews as podcasts to your computer, your Zune, your iPod, your iRiver, your Rio Diamond, whatever device you're listening to podcasts with this week. If you want to stay current on the Marketplace of Ideas, there is an easy way to do it. Sign up for the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. Instructions are right on the front Marketplace of Ideas page at callonmarshallradio.com. Very easy sign up, very simple stuff. You'll get weekly deliveries of a newsletter to your email inbox, listing off information about current and former and upcoming and all kinds of Marketplace of Ideas interviews, plus related interestingness on the internet. That's the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. Details at Colin Marshall Radio. Com. If you have questions, comments, or feedback on the show, don't hesitate. Send it to Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. That's Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Now, right back to the conversation with writer, traveler, and more, Pico Iyer, on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. He has a line in his Japan journals, a favorite book of mine is his diaries from his time in Japan, which I guess has been equal to his life almost. Which is that, I mean, I'm not going to get this wrong, I'm going to get this wrong, but uh, that he doesn't understand the compulsion to have a home, or he says, I, I would hate to be at home. Those mm -hmm. are his exact words, which resonate with me, though I haven't been around like he has. 
And I think then of how you say, you know, you're a foreigner everywhere. It's something you, you say here in this room. It's something that the, the Pico Iyer, the, the character in your books says, you know, and that's, that seems like a point of strong congruence between you two. I don't want to sound too weird about this, but I want to know about Pico Iyer, the, the textual entity, I mm-hmm. guess, because it's, I, I mean, you maybe have made reference to this in the books that you are not identical to to that Pico Iyer, uh, that you, your wife knows a different Pico Iyer than your friends know or than, than the books, than people get from your books. Mm. And I think of what are the characteristics of, of, of him, that Pico Iyer. And, you know, there is, as you mentioned with Donald Ritchie, a, a, an openness, you know, taking whatever, taking whatever in as it comes or seeming to. There is, there's a certain, a certain distance, but a distance that I want to see in, in a travel writer, quote unquote, in that, I mean, to, to name one example, you know, I, I'm sure, I'm sure that as he is a teetotaler, you also are, um, and I, there's a certain a certain way that say when when the Pico Iyer of the books is in Thailand observing the sex trade, there's a you know there's like I'll I'll keep this at arm's length, but I will observe it, you know, the no participation, thank you. Um, wh- how do you why do you think of that Pico Iyer? What a beautiful question, Colin. Nobody's ever asked me that in 23 years of my publishing books. And it's so cuts to the core. Of what they, the, they've wanted to. They've never had the opportunity. That's true. Well, they've never had the courage. I, <laughs> I applaud you for that and for thinking, reading the books closely enough to think about that. And of course, like every individual writer or not, I've changed in the last 23 years. You know, my first book I wrote when I was 29 and I'm 25 years older. So, so that aspect of the persona um, changes. But I think of myself as a method writer. Though I, um, I've never heard that phrase used elsewhere, <laughs> which is to say um, when Robert De Niro goes into a Scorsese movie or a Ben Stiller movie or whatever it happens to be, he works for months on end perhaps to find that part in himself that matches whether it's the comical CIA agent in, in Meet the Parents or the killer in Cape Fear or the, you know, uh, Jerry Lewis. Uh, was it Jerry Lewis? No, it was the boxer in um, in the famous Scorsese movie. The name I'm trying to think of while I... Well, yeah, I keep going. I'm yes, not going to think yes. of it now. Um, Jake LaMotta, maybe. Uh, fair enough. I think so, yes. Or, or um, in The Godfather. But anyway, so that's really get emails. what what um, what I do, which is to say that obviously the character has to come from me in part, but it's only a tiny, tiny part. And mm. each time I try to play a different role. So although there, there would inevitably be congruities and continuities, as you said, about the teetotaler, for example, uh, the main character in my novel, Abandon, who, who many people associate with, with me because he's living here in Santa Barbara and traveling around the world. Every night when he retires to his room, he has a glass of wine. So <laughs> there he's instantly on you that level. point to that. Least. There. He's not me. That's right. The there wine. we go. Even has a different name. <laughs> but um, I try really hard each time to tap a different aspect of myself. And for me, one of the beauties of writing is it's a way to look unsparingly at precisely the places in yourself that you'd always rather look away from, that it's kind of therapeutic exercise in that way. So it's a way to take myself on in some ways. And I want to open up enough of myself and hazard myself sufficiently that I'm actually um, ra- wrestling with myself as in a way that I m- might never do um, out- outside the page. But you're right. The, uh, and also, of course, on the page, things are disclosed about me or about any writer that are true even though we don't want them to be true and you, you, you have to confront things in, in that way. But I do try. So you used the lovely example of, uh, of Thailand and I've written a lot about it because I've probably been there more than 60 times in the last 28 years. And uh, sometimes there is a sense that this character is, has in fact disappeared into um, the <laughs> netherworld of uh, the th- Thailand bath. And sometimes it's written in a, in a much more remote way where I'm just taking a kind of Olympian view of this uh, right. hieronymus Bosch scene taking <laughs> on around me. But it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating. So I do see that as with the actor, every, every, time there's a pico hour on the page it's a simplification it's a caricature it's a distortion of the truth and yet it comes from a very deep truth and um and it reflects a part of me that is real and i think we're we're like that in all our interactions when you or i talk to our mother we're always playing one colin or Mm -hmm. one pico the one that's either she'll be comfortable with or that she knows or the one she's cast as us. And then when you're with your girlfriend or I'm with my wife, another one, but that's not the complete Colin or Pico because with our male friends, we're somebody yet different. <laughs> and I'm always interested in those sort of almost mutually incomprehensible, in- incomprehensible 
selves. Uh, so each book I do, and in my first book, Video Night in Kathmandu, part of my personal project, though I don't think any writer would either pick up, on, any reader would pick up on it or enjoy it, is that each chapter I tried to become a different person because I think travel does change you in those ways. And when I'm j- in Japan, say, I am more reserved, more polite. I have to observe the proprieties around me. I would never hug somebody in Japan. I would, uh, I would assume I'm kind of skating on the surface of the place. As soon as I'm in the Philippines, which is a very warm and expansive, open-hearted place, I would become a different person and I would write in a very, very different, much more heartfelt way. And that's something that's interested me that I don't think so many people who write about other places do. There's, they usually have a very specific persona that they carry from place to place. Whereas I want to see how each place remakes me in its own image and and brings out of me a very different persona. But one simple way that I notice what you're so asking so thoughtfully is that most people who like one of my books have no time for most of the others because each (laughs) one is, I hope, radically different. And so they anchor themselves in a book that's about spiritual seeking and the next minute they're in Los Angeles airport and getting dizzy and jet lagged. And and then there are people who like that because they move around in planes quite a bit and then they're suddenly exploring Buddhism in Japan and they're not comfortable with that. So, which is fine. Um, I'm happy to offer a fairly wide array uh, while knowing that there are few people who would want to stay with me every step of the course. Now, all the way through Video Night to the Open Road, the books thus far, I mean, the Pico Iyer on the page, I get the sense of well, two things. Number one, and this is truer in the earlier books than the later, but I, I sense a certain Puritan streak in this character, but I also sense, and I don't have to sense it, it's right there, I see, I see him making all kinds of friends everywhere um, without sort of, without without regard to any possible walls that could come up between two people. You know, there's a sense of, mm. a sense of like, well, you write about the Dalai Lama, uh, whom you know well, in, in The Open Road, trying to find the, the universals, the, the human truths connecting with humans on a, on, only on the levels that all humans can connect on. Mm. And I, don't, I wonder if that's part of this, but the core of this is that this page, Pico, both is both, both pulls himself out of certain parts of the world, but also engages in a way that seems like it would be, that seems like it requires you to almost lose your identity in a sense. And again, you know, I seem to be getting very high flown with these questions, but it seems like a little bit of a contrast to me, or maybe even a conflict. Maybe you can tell me why it isn't. Hmm. Well, I love the phrase page pico, and I think what you were just <laughs> describing is also how I very much see Donald Ritchie, and maybe one reason mm. I respond so excitedly to his work, that he's always an outsider but a deeply engaged one um, who's prepared to risk himself in in putting himself in situations, as you were, your question was yeah. suggesting, where he's going to be transformed. I must say the di- dissolving of self is one of my lifelong fascinations, one reason I spend so much time writing and so much time in monasteries. I'm, I'm happy to be rid of the Pico I, I carry around with me because I think all of us need that. Um, in terms of that contradiction, uh, my favorite book when I was growing up was, when I was in my teens, was Narcissus and Goldman by Herman Hesse, hmm. which is about two uh, young men who grow up very close uh, as close friends. One is a monk and one is an adventurer. And when I began writing my books, I quickly noticed, oh, well, there are these two personae and no, it's no surprise that book was my favorite. Uh, and it's no surprise that, for example, I write a lot about Leonard Cohen, who is known both as a man of the world and as a monk. And clearly that is one of the, if not conflicts, the interesting dialectics or conversations between two sides that I'm going to carry through my life and therefore uh, through my work. Listening to your question, I was thinking the dangerous truth is that if you're a visitor for two weeks, it's easy to throw yourself into situations because you know you're not going to have to live with them and that Mm. you're going to be leaving in two weeks. And I think that can make various um, treacherous consequences. And I think I tried to write quite a bit, places like Cuba in the night, about um, the shadow side of travel and the way that living in a, li- in a world, in a living in a life without responsibility, but devoted to sampling cultures, suddenly brings you into emotional situations where you're often betraying expectations. And I'm, I want to take myself to task, if insofar as that is you know, a tendency that I might have as I jump from, uh, from, from place to place. Uh, but I'm very glad you said that because you, uh, I, I think you're certainly putting your finger on something um, of, of consequence. And in in my next book, which we're not going to be, talk about at this 
today so much. Uh, there's quite a strong sort of memoir component, partly about what you and I were almost talking about at the beginning of this program, which is when I came to Santa Barbara as a little boy, I continued going to school at a 15th century boarding school in England. So I was commuting back and forth between California in the 60s and a 15th century cloistered, very (laughs) traditional uh, Christian school. So there you have Narcissus and government again. I mean, I was literally (laughs) from the age of nine, three times a year moving between really a monastery combined with the military academy and the full Dionysian splendor of hippie <laughs> California. So I'll probably never get, you know, we're all formed by, mm. by the central, if not contradictions, commutes that we make as, um, as children. And that's mine probably. Now, the, the page Pico, I guess I'll just start using that. that term, is He reminds me, now that I think about it, of a figure that will be familiar, I think, to you because of your roots in England. But Almost every English person I talk to, you know, they, their, their eyes light up at the mention of Tintin. Um, <laughs> because Tintin, the, ostensibly a boy reporter, he goes all around the world. But, I mean, we, I've read all those books, including the ones I can't read. And they, he never files a, a page of copy, as far as I understand. I mean, he goes around the world, makes, Tintin makes friends legendarily. Mm. Um, never does his job, as far as I can understand. Now, Pico Iyer, the page Pico, he's a writer, and we know he's a writer because we're reading his books. But it seems like to, to his friends he makes around the world, to the people he talks to, to his wife, <laughs> he's not a writer. Mm. Mm. Is, does, that make, does that resonate at all with how you see yourself in the text? Well, what you what you did what you just said very much, and I was thinking about it this morning. So I mentioned earlier that I always travel as a tourist, and I love to travel anonymously. And part of the beauty of travel for me is that I feel very strongly. I'm leaving my resume, my business card, the ways people would define me here at home, and most of all, um, I'm leaving my the hiding places and the routine by which I can find myself, and the ways in which sometimes I might define myself all at home and that's the exciting existential adventure of um, travel that when I'm walking down the streets of Havana or Rangoon and a local person passes me he doesn't care where I went to school or what job Mm. I have or whether I'm a writer or or, um, a thief but all he wants to find out is is this person open is he friendly is he kind and I love that essentializing quality Uh, and I think the more of one's superficial self one can leave behind in traveling, the, the more useful an exercise uh, it is. So you're right, there is a part of me um, that is a writer, but it's only a small part and it's not the most important part. And I was thinking about this in relation uh, to my wife because yesterday she attended the commencement exercise and she saw a whole side of me that she never sees in mm. private Japan. Uh, and so on the one hand, she was thinking, oh, well, that's interesting. You, you can actually go up on the, onto a stage and, and speak a couple of sentences. On the other hand, she knows me so well that nothing about how she knows me would really be changed. <laughs> and my definition of my friends is that they are the ones who don't care what I write and whose sense of who I am will never be affected by what I write. In other mm. words, who know me at so... Um, intimate or settled a way that they're not distracted by the page peeker. And there are very few, I think really most of those friends are people whom I knew before I began writing because most people I've known since I began publishing can't fail to see me through the eyes of that page peeker. And that's always a diversion. And I can tell that um, they don't know exactly what to make of me because they see one person sitting in their room talking with them and another on the page and they think, which one is true? Which one is false? Is he, <laughs> is this a disguise he's throwing up? And uh, I can, and they're going to be confounded by that forever as we all are because I find many of my friends writers and there's nothing more disconcerting often than reading what they've written because you see a whole side of them by definition private. It's very different from the person you know and you don't know what to make of it. And one of my favorite lines, you know, I've worked a lot uh, on the, the writings of Somerset Maugham, and in his novel Cakes and Ale, he has some sentence which I can't do justice to, but he talks about somebody smiling as he sees one person who's the public Somerset Maugham walking through the world, and another who's the Somerset Maugham on the page walking through the world, and realizing that neither of those fundamentally has to do with and the, the rich person that he recognizes. And that, uh, I very much resonate to that. So I see both of them as versions of the truth, but faxes, facsimiles, mm. uh, just the way that if you and I were sent to a fax machine to somebody tomorrow, <laughs> we'd come across a little blurred, indistinct, some, something of Colin or Pico would come through, but a very 
um, indistinct two-dimensional kind. So um, I've, I've lost my way in the corridors of my answer, but uh, it was a very good question. And uh, um, yes. Now, whatever, whatever Pico winds up on the page, there's, there's a lot of fuel that has to go into this, to this boiler to, to make this happen, to get this on the page. And it seems to me that you can't write these books. You know, these books don't exist without, again, I'll come back to word, we've used a huge amount of openness. Is that a cultivated quality? Or is that just something you had and used? <laughs> Probably the second. And it's no coincidence that I, I took great pains over titling my book on the Dalai Lama and the fact it's called The Open Road and that that's the adjective in there is very central to its meaning and its importance to me, really. So I think I would say that growing up in many cultures as first a British-born kid of Indian descent and then a boy who looked Indian and spoke British and was living in California and then many more permutations as the years went on. Uh, it, it has left me with certain good things and certain bad things. Good things being adaptable. Um, I can feel at home almost any culture I go in. I can, I think more than some people, because I don't have a very fixed sense of tradition or home or self, I can try imaginatively to put myself into the eyes of a, a Cuban or an Islamic mystic or a Buddhist or many things that I am not. The bad sides, of course, are that I'm not good at settling down to a family. I'm, I don't take a single position. I entertain a thousand of them usually. Uh, and instead of commitments or causes, I have this kind of mobile perspective. Um, so life, as with all of us, has qualified me for some things and disqualified me for others. So I think in terms of openness, I'm grateful that my itinerant upbringing has allowed me to look at most places as foreign and therefore interesting and I want to learn about them and I want to see how people in... Uh, North Korea or Ethiopia or Bhutan or Santa Barbara look at the world because it's not quite the way I would. Uh, on the other hand, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not good at having a single position from which I assess all these. But So I've because openness is something that uh, I've grown up with without choosing it, as you put it so well, I feel that I might as well use it, that my, my upbringing has allowed me to do certain things and I should try to do those because that's what I have to share with the world. And to go back to your previous question, I, I remember now what I had forgotten to say before. Um, it's so wonderful the way you phrase it, which is that the people I meet in these foreign countries barely would know. I'm a writer. Hmm. But also, I always take pains to travel on a tourist visa. I never go um, as an official writer, so I don't go and seek out officials. I want to see the, the private, um, unrecorded side of places, precisely what doesn't fit usually into Time magazine or, or the New York Times, because that has been so well covered by professional journalists. And so I want to go just as an everyman getting lost in the streets of uh, Rangoon and Hanoi and Beirut and seeing what, what comes to me. Uh, and if I thought of myself as a writer or presented myself as a writer, that would instantly create screens. So those are the kind of walls I'm happy to do without. For those just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas, and I'm Colin Marshall. This week, we're having a sit-down with Pico Iyer, writer, traveler, and more author of books including Video Night in Kathmandu, The Lady and the Monk, The Open Road, The Global Soul, and many more. If you want to hear our talk when it's over, visit colinmarshallradio.com to hear it again, or visit iTunes to hear it again. Open the iTunes store and search for the Marketplace of Ideas. In either place, you'll get access to the complete and completely free marketplace of ideas interview archive and if you want to stay updated on what's coming up on the marketplace of ideas there is no better way than to subscribe to the marketplace of ideas mailing list details at colinmarshallradio.com click on the marketplace of ideas logo and there you'll find a very simple way to sign up or to unsign up or whatever you'd like to do to the marketplace of ideas mailing list straight to your inbox every week if you have any responses, feedback, feelings, questions, suggestions, don't hesitate to send those straight to me, Colin, C-O-L-I-N, at colinmarshallradio.com. That's Colin at colinmarshallradio.com. Now right back to the conversation with Pico Iyer on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. I imagine a lot of people come to your books because, at least this is why I did, because they want to read a writer who comes from an Indian family but who grew up in England and California and who now travels the world. You know, they, they want that. Multifaceted is even the wrong word, but maybe it's a perspective separate of geography almost or separate of roots perhaps, or I, I don't quite know how to put that, but it seems like a desirable quality, that cross-culturalness, but... 
it seems to go the other way as well, that what you write about invariably, to my mind, tends toward where cultures overlap. And, you know, I don't want to sit here and psychologize saying, well, you, you, you write about that because you are that. But what about, what about the intermingling of cultures really fascinates you? And I know there's many answers, but perhaps at this moment, what fascinates you in that? Well, I think the only reason that I write about that mingling of cultures, which, as you say, I inherited at birth and then when we moved to California, is that most of the young people I meet now are much more international and multicultural than I. So I, through no grace of my own, stumbled into the circumstance that suddenly seems to be becoming the defining circumstance of the new century. Uh, and so I thought by creating a kind of cartography to the pros and cons of uh, of living in many cultures at once, as people like Salman Rushdie have done brilliantly before me, uh, I'm in some ways laying down a bit of a roadmap to what each new generation is going to be living through more and more, that uh, I just happened to grow up with three different cultures inside me. And now I think in many of the cities in the world, if you go to a university, uh, whether it's Toronto or Sydney or Paris or London, San Francisco, kids you meet will have five, six different cultures. Uh, <laughs> and so it's wonderful. So they will, they will be able to write much richer sequels to, um, as, as I've written a sequel to Rushti in some ways. Right now, um, I mean, I would say my work involves two parts, and we can take it back to Narcissus and Goldman. On the one hand, the adventurer is traveling around the world looking at the exchange of uh, notions between cultures, the way they project things onto each other, and the overlappings, as you said. On the other hand, the monk in me is looking at the place where all those distinctions dissolve because identity dissolves and that core in us that is universal. So that's clearly what the Dalai Lama speaks to and about. Wherever he is, he never feels a foreigner, never seems a foreigner and he instantly almost demystifies and disrobes himself and says, what I want to talk about is my common ground with you and what I and you, a homeless person in Santa Barbara, have in common. That's essentially the important thing. And I, I, as an admirer of him, I think he's absolutely right. Uh, and so that part interests me a lot, the place where distinctions between nations and religions uh, and circumstances dissolve. And that's also, of course, the excitement of traveling. So when I meet that person on the streets of Rangoon who doesn't know I'm a writer, um, what is really happening is we're both trying to find that place in each of us that has common ground with the other. I always think of identity and opinion as, you know, these are the things people build up. Perhaps they build their identities out of opinion. Um, and that, that puts up the walls between them. And you seem in, I don't know whether this is a page Pico thing or a Pico Pico thing, but you seem to fight back the moments where that might happen. I'll use an example because I, I read a lot, a lot of writers writing about place. Place is kind of the most interesting thing to me. And they say, oh, well, Bali, spoiled. You know, it's going down the drain. Or they'll say, oh, Nepal, Tibet, done for. This, the, all of Santa Barbara, done. Yeah. Oh, if only I was in the pre-lapsarian time of all these places. I don't sense any judgment about place from you. And that seems odd because place has, in, in, in a certain way, been your main subject, and you've avoided, you've avoided judgment. But I think in that way have gotten infinitely more out of it. I think if you were judging these places, you would have maybe like one book to your name, right? That that limits you, doesn't it? Well, it's beautifully said. I'm so, and again, I'm so grateful to you for saying that because uh, no one has quite put it like that, let alone so thoughtfully. And you're absolutely right. Um, I don't believe in opinion. And mm. I think, as just as you said so well at the end of your question, opinion constrains us. It blinkers us. It keeps us away from the variety of the world. Uh, the subject of my next book, Graham Greene, when he was a boy, was growing up in the same school of which his, his father was headmaster. And so what he quickly found was that he was hanging out with his classmates. He was essentially betraying his father. <laughs> and uh, and yet if he went and, and sided with the Green family and Mr. Green, then he was leave, uh, abandoning his classmates. And so he quickly found himself in that position where he could see both sides of the division, both sides of the Green Bay's door um, on the corridor, as he puts it, and yet could belong entirely to neither, to both, to neither. Um, so when he was talking to his father, he could see his classmate's side. When he was talking to his classmates, he could see the father's side. And of course, one reason I'm fascinated with him is that I grew up in those ways and chose, as you put it, um, to throw my arms fully around this sense. Uh, Leonard Cohen, who's a great, uh, 
um, hero of mine, because of his very serious Zen practice, would say identity and opinion don't exist, that they're mm. immaterial. And um, I love that. In fact, I have in my computer one of the only statements I have there is a long probably nine-sentence uh, dismantling of the notion of opinion by Leonard Cohen. And oh. I suppose the reason I had it was that it enshrines that principle that I hadn't even been aware of until you asked the question uh, so well. But somebody once asked me if I believed in beginner's mind, that Zen principle. Mm-hmm. And I loved that phrase too because that notion of – and it's deep in Japan as well as deep in Zen – that you walk into a place and you just take it in. And it has nothing to gain from your opinions of it. And as you said, you have nothing to gain. You have everything to lose from putting it into boxes or categories or bringing your assumptions with you. I, I, go t- I travel in order to be, see all the things I don't know and to be persuaded of how wrong all my notions are. So the last thing I want to do is to go to North Korea and say, well, this looks stupid from a Santa Barbara perspective. I've gone there to see it from a North Korean perspective and then to see Santa Barbara, as you before mentioned, from uh, uh, a North Korean perspective. And one thing I will say... I've Jeez, never, how must that look? Um, yes, not paradisal, as a North Korean would see it, uh, because uh, the capital of North Korea is much more spotless, of course, much more regimented, much more disciplined, uh, much more utopian in certain Disneyland ways than Santa Barbara is. But I've never meditated a day in my life. But if my wife were sitting with us as we speak, she would say, well, all you do is meditate. Because every morning you wake up, you go to your desk, you sit with your pen, and you see through your thoughts. You try to see what's behind your thoughts and behind the self that you have constructed. This goes to a lot of your questions. And one thing that I've come to see more and more in um, as the years go on, is as I sit longer at my desk, is that I don't trust any of my opinions because I think, mm. and I have opinions, but they evaporate as the moment does, as the clouds passing across the sky do. And what I come to see is that everything I would say, including what I'm saying now, is the product of the mood in the moment. So if you asked me the same question tomorrow, I'd give a totally different answer. And if I asked you a question, you would give a different answer at 7 p.m. tonight mm. from 1 p.m. We, you know, in that sense, I'm, although I'm not a Buddhist, I can see why Buddhists say that the self is perpetual flux and it's a river constantly moving and you can't put it into boxes, you can't cage it, and it makes no sense even to define it, because the self you are tomorrow will contradict the, the, and the self you are right now. Uh, and all of us know that if we're morning people, we're groggy and bleary at 4 p.m., <laughs> and we're crystal clear and, and in heaven at 9 a.m., perhaps, and vice versa if you're a night person. And so given all that, the um, opinion deconstructs itself, I would say. And so although I have opinions, and if I'm talking to my friends and they say, what's Damascus like, I will give a passionate endorsement. And if they ask mm. me what Atlanta is like, I'll probably give a <laughs> passionate denunciation. But I don't think those are interesting. And certainly as a writer... Um, you know, every objective account is slanted, of course. So when I'm describing Atlanta, I'm probably describing it in a seemingly objective way that gives a person a very bad opinion. And so in some ways, I'm, my opinion is just being more subtly and insidiously woven into the piece. But the less opinion, the better. I certainly hold to that. And I wonder what I'm picturing a listener now tuning in, hearing this, maybe knowing knowing of your work or maybe having read a little bit of it. And they say to themselves, oh, this Pico Iyer, he, he, I thought he was a travel writer. So he writes about like places where I might want to go, and that's why I'll read him. But here he's saying he doesn't like identity, he doesn't like opinion. Okay, so he's not you know rating the places. Uh, he's not writing guides with if you go boxes, you know what to pack. He's not he's not doing a lot of things. You know what what can you say about what that leaves you? Because I mean, you write substantial books, especially the first one was was it was of a had, had a very a page heft to it, you know, and certainly identity and opinion were were largely absent. What would you say you're left with to write about? Well, I think there was more, much more opinion in the first book, Video Night in Kathmandu, than there would be now, because mm. uh, I was much, you know, I was in my 20s, I was bratty, I was keen to pronounce judgments on people and places <laughs> I'd barely met, so um, if that one had little opinion, the ones later were even less so. But I think even then, what I was trying to do was to use your word, to present um, with an open eye, right. how places come to somebody who's just stepped off the plane for them. And also you're not flatly describing because as you've said elsewhere, d- there's no place for purely visual and sonic description. You can access mm. that somewhere else. So you're once more something ruled out. Well, uh, and uh, I think that is a more recent phenomenon. Mm. When I began um, writing, so that was in 1985, I made my first trip to across Asia. There was no internet. There was very little cable TV. If somebody sitting in Santa Barbara wanted to know what Tibet looked like or 
Cuba sounded like, she probably couldn't. And so mm. in those days, there was a, I put a lot of visual and sonic information. And it's interesting, my first few books uh, seemed to appeal very strongly to photographers. Uh, and I think what they sensed was that I was doing the verbal equivalent to what news or reportage photographers do, which is essentially walk down the street with my camera rolling um, or clicking away and just catching visual moments and asking those to speak for themselves. So I did a lot of that initially. But you're so right. Nowadays, when somebody who never leaves her room can see so much of the world, I, I try to catch what isn't visible and, and the spaces between the lines. And, and uh, you could say the philosophical reverber reverberations of places more than the physical reality or the sensual reality because that's widely available in more exciting media. And it is something I've noticed in your books, you know, when, if I do approach them as that, as reporting on a place, if I almost approach them as, you know, my own equivalent of the Lonely Planet book, I've never read one of those, but I, these are the books I use instead, the books of Pico Iyer and others. Often, and it's more the case with your books than others, often I'll be pointed toward a place I wouldn't have considered going. You mm. know, these, these are not books that confirm my desires about where to go. Um, for example... One of the books I, th I think I skipped over when we started, uh, Falling Off the Map, uh, the chapter on Paraguay. Hmm. I, now I want to go there more than most places, <laughs> I have to admit. You know, what is it? And that's probably the last country a lot of people, I mean, people don't necessarily know what or where it is. Hmm. So what is, what is that force? Is there a force that drives you to want that to happen to readers to say, well, wait a second, m maybe I, maybe I haven't been framing the world in the wrong way or is it just a byproduct of what happens? Well, I'm delighted if any reader's assumptions are overturned. <laughs> and many of the pieces I do are for major glossy magazines which tend every month to cover Hawaii, Paris and Venice. And I make a really pronounced <laughs> Santa attempt. Santa Barbara for that matter. Exactly. So I try to smuggle in Ethiopia and Bolivia and Cambodia and uh, uh, with a kind of um, agenda in, in mind because I think those places are more interesting often than the ones that we somewhat know already. Uh, and I certainly travel uh, and I'm keen to encourage others to travel uh, to be presented with something as different and as difficult and as challenging as possible. Mm. So if somebody is working 50 hours a week and has two weeks of vacation, then they should go to Paris or Venice or Hawaii or the most relaxing and beautiful place possible. But for somebody like me who's lucky enough to travel quite a bit and who's lucky enough to live in Santa Barbara and Japan, which is, we were saying, are two places that the envy of much of the world, I want to travel to places as far away from that reality as possible, often difficult, corrupt, uh, unpleasant, impoverished or oppressed places. I will tell you regarding Paraguay um, that that speaks to a different dirty secret, which is a wonderful place for a writer because everything is zany and ironic and fugitive <laughs> and crooked. It's not such a great place for a traveler. Right. So one would only go there to write. And that's the rare place where I went knowing it'd be fun to write about, even though it's not a, a holiday <laughs> <laughs> attraction that I would otherwise uh, otherwise choose. You mentioned Graham Greene and, and how he's involved in the next book you're going to put out. And I remember hearing at the LA Times Festival of Books, you wrote a few hundred pages on him and proceeded to throw those away. And he, his name comes up often in, in your books. I'm thinking of other names that do. Uh, there's the occasional mention of, a, of a Paul Theroux or of yes, no, Paul. I mentioned, uh, mentioned Salman Rushdie and uh, many figures, Kazuo Ishiguro, all, all names that uh, cross boundaries a lot. And I want to know if you think of them, as, you and them as being on the same map, and these are people you you are, whether you like it or not, positioned relative to, literarily speaking. Mm. Well, thank you for reading uh, my book so carefully and pulling all, all those kinships out, because you're absolutely right. And each of them probably corresponds to one s small part of me, one of the many page peakers that I could play. And any time I investigate one of them, I'm investigating clearly an issue in myself. Uh, I think Oscar Wilde said all criticism is autobiography, and I think that's a <laughs> That's a great truth, that every picture one takes is in some ways a self-portrait, even if you're a documentary photographer. So when I was re writing this Graham Greene book, at a relatively late stage, I thought to myself, goodness, I could have written a whole book about Leonard Cohen in the same way and explored a different side of me. And I could have done one on Emerson and Thoreau, who are probably the people closest to my spirit, and investigated that very affirmative transcendentalist part of me. And uh, I could have written a, a, a Rushdie book and looked at the um, globalist aspect of me, except I 
I've sort of done that already. But yes, mm. each of them corresponds to a different part of me. And before each book, I probably am making a conscious decision, which part of me is still unexplored, which do I want to tunnel into right now, um, and maybe which is going to um, throw me back most because I think embarking on a book is a lot like embarking on a journey and as I was just saying I like um, going into difficult or treacherous places and so to answer your previous question again I'm really happy if I encourage readers to go to places they've never thought of going before because the one advantage that I've had getting to see so many places is to find many of these hidden treasures and many we often have this in our hometown we find some little restaurant no one's even heard of and uh, it's so terrific we want to share it with our friends more than the famous fancy restaurant in town so that's how I feel about place like Syria or Cuba or Bolivia that I think most travelers would hugely enjoy but they're not the first places that come to their minds in order to find those places of in yourself that mm. uh, that uh, are unexplored can you do that with reflection or do you have to thrust yourself into some sort of real world differing set of circumstances than you're used to to go there? I mean, can you can you know what the places are that you have to explore within yourself without shaking up your actual environment? Is this a reflective thing or a physical thing? Both. And um, reflection ap appeals to me more and more. And as mm. I was just saying, my two favorite travelers probably are Thoreau and Emerson. Emerson, who said traveling is a fool's paradise. If you expect to find anything abroad, you couldn't find at home. <laughs> and uh, Thoreau, who said, why go around the world to count the cats in Zanzibar? That the really <laughs> important Pacific Ocean that we're crossing or Northwest Passage that we have to navigate is the one in our subconscious or in our divided heart or whatever. So I'm a great believer in that. Emily Dickinson is another huge hero of mine that you'll probably start seeing more and more in my pages because mm. she found the whole world including eternity and death and pitilessness and light in her tiny little room in Amherst, Massachusetts. And I think they're the ones as much as Melville who, you know, Melville, Melville traveled the physical world but only as a way to go into the metaphysical world. And I think that's what exhilarates him. He, of course, was known as a travel writer in his time but now the only reason we want to read him is not to read about the Marquesas of Tahiti because we have <laughs> much better and more vivid uh, accountings of them now, but to go into those fearless places uh, existentially that, that he went. So I'm most interested in the travel that I could do uh, at my desk. And I often think physical travel is a, is a way to jumpstart the process. Uh, as soon as we're in a foreign place, we're existentially stripped and we're back to very primal emotions of fear and excitement and childlike quality almost. We're undefended, we're vulnerable. And so it's an easy way to... to make the encounter with oneself. But Thoreau, my hero, or Proust, another hero, did it wonderfully, um, well, completely through reflection. And I think that appeals to me more. I feel that we have two mandates in life. One is to get to know the world and one is to get to know the self. And I very consciously try to balance those and make sure that one isn't being favored over the other in my writing. So my initial books were a lot about physical movement and about taking in, as you said, the surfaces of the world. And I thought, well, I want to know the five continents and many cultures as possible for a while. And then having done that quite a bit, I thought, well, now what I really need to do is go to those unexplored places myself. I've taken care of a lot of the physical world, but the emotional or moral or psychological world, I haven't looked at so much. And so now I have to uh, make myself um, the subject of investigation as once I did Paraguay or Iceland or North Korea. And then having done that now, for so I'd say I did five books of geographic exploration, five of more inward exploration, and now it's five and five, and I've just completed my tenth book. I'm going to have to see how to shake it up again and to take myself somewhere I haven't been before. I do see around me, you know, whether in books or whether in just real life, people tend to fall off one side or the other of that balance as a rule. You know, you get mm. the... It, I, myself, I oscillate between them, you know, excessively introspective, mm -hmm. get, getting arid or excessively unreflective, you know, uh, the caricature of the vacationing Australian, perhaps, I don't mm -hmm. know. But do you, do you see that as the main challenge here? And I mean, this, maybe you've just said that in your last answer, but I do want to know is as just holding steady between, between those, however, however you find a way to do that. But is, is that a, a does that have some primacy, you know, in your mind? Very much. In mm. fact, I mean, I think you just described how I try to live my life, which is to balance contemplation with action, self with world, breathing in with breathing out. And so um, traditionally, for many years now, I've tried to spend about six months a year in Japan, which is where I don't even have a bicycle or or a car, and I live in a two-room apartment in the middle of nowhere. So that's my Walden Pond. That's a very, very contemplative, settled, inward 
place. And then I tried to spend six months to keep myself honest going out into the world. I mean, since, since I saw you two months ago, I was in Oman and Dubai and Paris and New York a couple of times and I'm on my way, way to uh, Hyderabad and St. Petersburg and Tallinn and many other places. So I, I try very hard to keep those in balance. And Thoreau would be a wonderful example because, of course, he famously was traveling in, in Cape Cod and Maine and other places and traveling in the two years where, where he barely left Walden. And I, I want to keep, keep that alive because, as you said, I think um, unless you have both in your life, there's something that's distorted or unbalanced. I've been speaking with Pico Iyer, author of many books all the way from Video Night in Kathmandu to The Open Road, with another one coming soon by, by publishing standards in the blink of an eye. Pico, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank you. This has been a real delight, Colin. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas, and I've been Colin Marshall. If you want to hear this conversation again, it's as easy as loading it up in the podcast version at colinmarshallradio.com or on iTunes, search in the iTunes store for the Marketplace of Ideas. Either way, you'll get the full Marketplace of Ideas interview archive there. You can download them all to your heart's content. The website of Ben Althaus, the man who makes our theme music, is as always available at benalthaus.com. And if you have questions, comments, feedback of any kind, don't hesitate. Send it along to Colin, C-O-L-I-N, at colinmarshallradio.com. I can also keep you current on all things Marketplace of Ideas with the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. Weekly updates on the show straight to your inbox. Sign up for that at colinmarshallradio.com as well. Instructions, very simple, very easy, easy to unsubscribe if you feel like it, are right there on the front page. Just go to colinmarshallradio.com, click the Marketplace of Ideas, and there you'll find how to sign up for the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. As always, thanks for tuning in. We will catch you next time on the Marketplace of Ideas for more cultural conversation of the depth you demand.